Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of Office Hours. Uh, I am your host, Joe Perfetti, and joining me as always is my co-host, Scott Coer. Uh, today, we are honored to have Dr. Richard LeBlanc, uh, who is the author of the Handbook of Board Governance, uh, now in its second edition, and a leading expert on boards around the world. Uh, so I just wanna thank you for taking the time today, Richard, to join us. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you, Scott. And <clears throat> Scott, do you want to say hello to our audience? Yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, folks. Glad to be back with you. And, um, you know, we're very lucky to have Richard with us today. As we think about all of the things that are changing around us, uh, you know, it's easy to lose sight of the importance of the roles of corporate directors when, uh, when we think about the changing marketplace. So, Richard, glad you're here. My pleasure. Yeah, and, and Richard, um, you know, not only is, is an author, uh, I can't even name the amount of acronyms he has after his name of degrees, uh, and an expert, but uh, it works with boards regularly. So we wanted to take advantage of his practical experience. In fact, maybe that's where we can start today in our conversation, uh, which is, you know, in the COVID world, you know, I'm sure boards have had to struggle with uh, changes that companies are going through. So what are some of the things that the boards that you're dealing with are top of mind relative to COVID, Richard? Well, COVID is interesting uh, because it's, um, it's very fast and the science is emerging almost on a daily basis. So uh, directors have never encountered this before and most directors are not uh, scientists. And, and, you know, most politicians are not scientists either. So I some of you um, dispute that, but go ahead. So, so, some will assert, some, some, some politicians may assert that they are scientists. Yeah. Uh, so, so in other words, uh, boards are struggling to, not only to keep up, but to keep ahead. And um, so what I'm seeing now are, are, are what is called pandemic plans, which is uh, as, as we emerge from lockdown, what are the, uh, risks, uh, particularly to employees and to uh, customers and to other stakeholders uh, in emerging from uh, lockdown. Um, and this includes not, you know, the traditional PPE um, and, and, and masks, but also depending on your industry and depending on your circumstances, um, governments at all three levels, uh, federal, provincial, uh, a state in your case and 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 local uh, have best practices that are are emerging um, and one case I'm working with right now is you know the the board is dividending is, is sending dividends to shareholders but there are several wrongful death lawsuits uh, because the 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 PPE was not adequately provided to employees uh, and to and to frontline uh, workers so um, so I think there's going to be a lot of litigation surrounding the pandemic. Uh, and they, you know what, they, they chase boards of directors because the board is, is the organ that, 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 that ultimately approves all of management action. So, so good boards, and I also help good boards, not just the boards that got into trouble, but the good boards are saying they're asking for stress testing of financial, uh, statements given the pandemic. They're asking for revisions to the strategic plan. They're asking for revisions to, um, to executive compensation, but first and foremost is what are the risks to our stakeholders and what are the internal controls to mitigate those risks and how do we adjust that? For example, if we have a second surge and we're starting to see this even in Canada uh, with schools, back to school, et cetera, uh, what are the contingencies for this, for this second surge and how will it affect the business and how will it affect wellness of, of employees? So boards want, boards now are, are it's all hands on deck and you know in your agile chapter it's very apt right now because boards are meeting more frequently they're meeting you know some boards are meeting every week every couple of weeks just to stay on top of of what is happening with covid so, so there are two points that i think come out of this um, the first one is role of management versus the board because it seems like in a crisis Shouldn't management be taking the front seat and then the board be following or because you get too many cooks in the kitchen? And yeah. So so and I know that you seem has has a uh, uh, Mike, you and Ram Sharan have, uh, you know, when should the board take charge? And, and they've got crisis here in their lower left quadrant. And Joe, I agree with you that 
in this uh, in this type of crisis, um, you know, the board really doesn't have, and this is nothing personal for boards. They just don't have the knowledge. They don't have the experience. So boards have 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 defaulted, and and we now have a term liberated CEO, where the CEOs are are running the shop, and boards have sort of because of the crisis, boards have sort of backed up. And they've given man. You think of a of a of a long leash. They've given management a very long leash, and now as the crisis, and I'm not suggesting by any means that you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, come out of this anytime soon. But board and I'm counseling boards. Listen, don't uh, obviate your oversight role. I mean, we're in a crisis, but you st you still have a duty of care. You've got a fiduciary duty, so you can you can still oversee the management of of a crisis. So this. This management line, governance line, which you're talking about, Joe, is sometimes clever managers will use a crisis to push the board up. And, and then a board, it's very difficult when you're so high to regain that oversight role. So uh, my counsel to boards is don't let COVID push you outside of the boardroom. And with remote governing right now, and most boards, my client boards, are all working from home. So it's a double whammy because number one, you've got a crisis, and number two is you don't have that sort of personal contact that you would from coming into the office, coming into the boardroom. So it's it's difficult. To, you don't want to get too high, but also the counterpoint is you don't want to be in management's face, right? And you don't want to be picking up the phone every time there's a media story about the company. So where that line is 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 important for boards. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, Joe, uh, Richard, I think about this in, in the in the following metaphors. So, uh, you know, many of us have read the the Moving Fast and Slow book by Kahneman. And, you know, Kahneman Tversky did a lot of good work when they were talking about risk taking versus risk aversion. And, you know, just as you highlight, Richard, you know, don't want to move too high. Boards don't want to think too slowly. They don't want to become too engaged in that long term uh, you know, broad based perspective, uh, you know, sometimes it's good for them to move back to that fast thinking where they interact with the leadership team a little more frequently. And they say, hey, how are we doing with this? You know, what's going on with the evolution of our uh, uh, thinking on the business model, given that the environment is changing so that, you know, thinking fast and slow with the board uh, is a very important conversation because staying uh, in touch uh, without overtaking the management is important. And at the same time, as you highlight, you know, getting up too high or focusing too much on that long range plan or uh, vision is uh, is also dangerous. Especially if you're in an industry and I'm thinking of nursing homes and uh, uh, great example. Uh, uh, um, animal processing uh, in, in the U.S. and also nursing homes in the U.S. and in Canada as well is it that's all it takes is is a month of of uh, being asleep at the switch and then you're sued and I'm I'm and I, I when I when a board is sued I ask for all the documents and I see what the board saw so then I make the case I said listen you 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 saw this it's almost like a slow moving train wreck you saw this but you chose not to act. And the regret that directors have is they 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 get mesmerized by management and and they get sugar coated. But you saw the data, you saw the risks changing. And and when I see disasters, Scott, it's because they're not agile. They're not re responding in a real time way because ma and management has a word for it. Management calls it NIFO, nose in, fingers out. So, so <laughs> when a board begins to assert itself. Um, and this is 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 the the board that takes charge. And this is where I really am supporting uh, Mike Useem is is uh, when a board sees something um, and it, it 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 by not acting, um, it's 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 neglecting its duty of care, particularly when when it's all hands on deck, right? And something is moving very quickly. Um, there's always a tendency, there's such a bias towards, especially with boards, there's a bias towards inertia, towards legacy, you know, even in a crisis. I mean, most boards meet four or five, six times a year, maybe, maybe, maybe five in the U.S., uh, probably that one meeting less in Canada, they meet six or seven. And, you know, they meet, they review, they have a three or four hour board meeting. Uh, but those, as you say in your agile chapter, those days are gone. 
because good boards now meet um, regularly. Uh, some boards meet monthly, but some boards get regular information flow. But the most important thing is when they see something, they need to act. And that's and to, to, to know when, where, and how to act and to pick your spots judiciously is, is really the art of being a good board. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You know, Joe, we talk a lot about the industry of higher education. So, you know, 4,100, 4,200 institutions of higher ed in, in the United States. And although not for profit, they have fiduciary bearing responsibilities. So your point, Richard, about when you see something act, uh, we've been looking at the various institutions that have performed well and been able to interact with the COVID pandemic in a manner where they haven't had to chew up cash, cash reserves from their endowment because uh -huh. the enrollment naturally will dip or the increased costs of having students come back to campus. You know, this is historic for institutions of higher education. And, you know, those institutions doing better, I would argue, are the ones where the boards are holding onto the wheel, engaged, as you said, and very in tune with the leadership of these institutions of higher ed. So let's just you know deal with a practical issue, whether it's higher ed or <clears throat> um, businesses. What do we do about people coming back to the office? Um, what what should the board's role be in that conversation, especially when you see you know people start getting infected in the office? And and you know is that how's that fit into the pandemic plan? And what should their role be? Well, there's um, in New York, there's about 10% of the latest figures. Toronto, it's about 10% as well, 10, maybe 10, 15% of people that are coming back to the office. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when you look at the surveys, the biggest issue that people have is actually the elevators and the social distancing in the elevators. So uh, good, good companies will invest in technology and have uh, contact tracing uh, companies. And in fact, the province of Ontario has a separate app um, so that when you begin to open and you stagger, you're looking at staggering shifts, you're looking, because we know the science. The science um, is that it is an aerosol-based uh, uh, virus, um, uh, which means it's highly transmissible. And uh, I think working from home for, I mean, we saw, for example, one of the large financial institutions said uh, that they're going to bring, start to bring employees back. Many of the financial institutions in Canada, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, et cetera, they're, 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 they're banking on a, a, almost a permanent work from home with certain functions that have to be hybrid where they come into the office for certain meetings. But the office itself is transforming uh, uh, t uh, itself. Um, so the use of technology, the use of uh, staggered shifts, the use of PPE in the workplace, uh, uh, you know, maintaining social distancing. And I think, you know, Scott's point about higher ed, uh, they actually have a, a jump on the businesses because higher ed has already started. And it's and, and I agree with Scott, it's not a matter of throwing cash at this. There's a way to thread the needle and in the dance phase where you've got a hybrid and you've got students that are distanced um, and you're you're thinking creatively uh, about it. Um, and you you can achieve, for example, University of Toronto is is open for business. Um, and my university, York University, is not. Um, and those are the two major universities in Toronto. So so some universities are open. Uh, they're educating uh, the students. Uh, they're re they're reacting very swiftly to any uh, breakouts. They've got contact uh, tracing. They've got treatment. Um, they've got isolation uh, abilities uh, for for outbreaks. Um, there there's full disclosure uh, by by the by the schools by the universities. Uh, there's regular briefings by the politicians. Um, so I think it is possible to uh, to to reopen with strong board uh, oversight. But in the middle of all that, and I'll just be very specific to my students at the University of Maryland, um, without giving any you know HIPAA stuff away. You know we, we're dealing with infections on campus, and there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress by the faculty. There's a lot of stress by the administrative staff. And, and actually, something I underestimated, there's a lot of stress by my students. My yeah. students are just so stressed out, even with the assignments. It's a different world than they were yeah, at, um, uh, you know, six months ago. 
Uh, and, and it's just not something you can realize how much stress people are under when they're trying to do all this. It, it, it's actually more than that, Joe. It's it's significant anxiety and depression um, yeah. by a number of uh, uh, companies and individuals by, because of the work from home environment. And we're all social beings. So, you know, good boards now are asking for wellness. And this is your second topic, wellness checks uh, for yeah. employees and for and for customers and stakeholders. In fact, in Canada now, we our fiduciary duty changed last year that boards of directors actually have an affirmative obligation for employee wellness. So we're I'm starting to see questions in boardrooms about the mental health of employees and, and about, uh, you know, outreach, regular outreach to employees and having services available. Uh, you know, this is we've, we've never seen anything like this. And and we're starting, you know, even some universities have seen suicides and so it, it is, it is, it, there's anxiety and there's ways of dealing uh, of, uh, with that. But I, you know, I empathize fully with, uh, you know, having oversight and programs and policies that are available to address wellness concerns, because often it's not disclosed and there's embarrassment, et cetera. But I, th I say, and I've done work with mental health uh, boards is put it out in the open. You know, there's, there's substance abuse, there's, there's issues that have become really acute during the pandemic and it's okay it's not okay not to ask and it's not okay to pretend it doesn't exist it exists so let me just ask you is this then a board committee is this part of a dashboard like how are they tracking this or is this just a simple one-time presentation what are you seeing no no this is this is and this brings us into to the to the topic of esg this is this ESG and for for the for the viewers ESG is environment social governance this is there's always there's been three traditional committees on a board there's been an audit committee a pay committee and a governance and nominating committee the audit committee looks at the numbers of the the financial reporting and the risks the pay committee looks at your CEO succession what you're paying your CEO and the nominating and governance committee looks at getting people onto the board orienting them and then getting them off of the board well, we know, for example, that the majority of a company's value is non-financial. So, so ESG, prior to the pandemic, ESG has always been second shrift. In other words, it's always not been taken as seriously as the other committees. I am beginning to see now, because of the pandemic, and I look at this as the third movement. The first movement was Enron. The second governance movement was the financial crisis of 2008. The third one is what we're going through right now, which is the pandemic. I'm starting to see fourth committees uh, or, or ESG being brought into either the governance committee or the HR uh, committee. I'm starting to see ESG get, get the board attention that it deserves. Um, so ESG is taken very seriously by good boards. It's also beginning to mature and to be quantified and to be and to be attended to because without attention at the board level it sort of doesn't get managed right yeah. we're seeing for example black lives matter targeted a hospital a major canadian hospital uh two days ago sunnybrook um i got up i got an email from a board chair a week ago saying that all the directors have gotten a letter from uh from uh, uh black and latino people in the workplace alleging uh, uh bullying and toxicity uh and racism so we we see for example boards that are saying well hang on a second here what what are is this happening in our company and and what what policies and and practices do we have in place that's enabling this to happen right yeah. So, so we even see with Rio Tinto, for example, the resignation or the firing of a CEO for for uh, for for uh, not taking indigenous uh, uh, rights of, of land uh, uh, seriously. So ESG uh, is is front and center, uh, not just now because of the pandemic, but I think it'll be front and center for the next ten years. Yeah, and just to add, add on with this, Richard, um, this is actually a screenshot, screenshot from Bloomberg. And uh, Bloomberg, uh, which is the pr pro tool for the investment industry, actually has created the ESG scorecard, uh, which companies are managed on. And this is Rio's scorecard. And, and they actually are starting to develop metrics. Uh, so again, in the financial community, we're looking at this well, because mutual funds are increasingly making ESG investment choices. Uh, and if you are not you know, responsible and sustainable, 
uh, you actually may not fit their investment criteria going forward. So there's a financial element to this as well, yes. which is is to the forefront. But it's interesting to see how, as, as you mentioned with Rio Tinto, how it went so far to the point that they said, look, you know, we're going to be, you know, socially responsible here. And if you go and violate the rights of people, you can't be part of the company anymore. Yeah. And that's a big move for an environmental space, particularly for the mobile company. Yes, yes. Or even seeing uh, 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 investors suing companies, companies uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, misrepresentation of diversity and saying that there are black, black uh, 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 people on the board, board um, and there are there women, women, women uh, on the board, uh, board um, and we want to uh, support the board to look to like, 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 uh, uh, like the membership or the shareholder base of the, the customer base, base of the company. So, so, so this, yeah. is, this, is, this is long overdue. It really is. By the way, we're getting uh, some serious uh, reverb, Richard. Is that your microphone? No, no, um, um, I don't think, I don't think so. so. I'm using my regular microphone. I put Scott and myself on mute. I think it was just the reverb on your microphone. For some reason, it's very high. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe yours or or mine, Joe, as well. So you know, on this on this ESG path. Uh, Richard, you started to take us down the path of, you know, so boards need to ask, you know, they need to ask the question, raise these issues. And um, I'm reminded there was a Financial Times article just a couple of months ago that talked about Dominetics, the working from home movement that was identified back in uh, 1969 by a guy named uh, David Kieran. The point for me in this discussion is our board's uh, looking at the environment? Are they scanning the environment in a way to offer feedback to the executive team so they can ask themselves, how are we running our businesses? Is this a time of change? And, and Richard, you know, you highlighted this is, you know, uh, the third of three major trend adjustments that you see among boards. I agree with you. In fact, I think it will be the question finally how do we best do our work? Do we best do our work by uh, putting ourselves, all of our employees within, within buildings? Or are we able to do work differently at significant savings to the companies and then shareholders for return? So uh, within, uh, again, just to take us back to the higher education industry, and then I'll jump to healthcare. But, you know, in higher education, we now know uh, that uh, many of our institutions in the United States have invested in facilities the way coal firing plants uh, have uh, legacy cost. It's time to move away from legacy expenditures. Many institutions have tens of millions of dollars in sunk costs looking at how they maintain their facilities. That does not serve the students and it drives the cost up. Quickly to healthcare. Uh, uh, Joe, I know you've got uh, a couple of clients in relations with uh, health executives who have said, hey, we were doing zero on telehealth. Now we're doing, you know, 20,000 uh, a week. Uh, so, you know, Joe, that ties right into your question. Well, Scott, I, I want to say that, uh, and this is actually related, <clears throat> there's a, a very funny movie on Netflix called Desperados. Uh, it, it's has no social value. It's just a, a stupid, funny movie. But there's there's a line in the movie which I thought was actually kind of interesting. And and basically this this woman says, we didn't go this far just to come this far. And then she's going off and doing some crazy, stupid stuff. And, and I think that's actually one of the problems that boards get caught up in. Mm. It, it, in finance, we call it a sunk cost. And and we, we need to understand that at some point we have to reallocate. And, and we have to get past the past and we have to start putting ourselves in a position to be sustainable for the future. And it's it's really hard to do that, whether especially when we've been successful in the past, to tell people that you have to stop doing what you're doing. And I think that's one of the biggest problems higher education that you're talking about is having now is we have to change the way we deliver education. But we, we, we're so invested in what we've done in the past. It's like we just got to keep doing more of it. And that's such a hard thing for organizations to do. And I think that's a struggle that board members actually have to try to catalyze for companies. Well, I think what health and it, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Now okay. perfect now. I think what health and education have done is COVID has accelerated uh, 
uh, both telehealth and uh, online delivery um, in a way that, you know, with, with, with doctors, I mean, I, I, I regularly help ho hospital boards and, you know, there are doctors that, that don't have an email. They don't, they, they just use phone. They, they don't have, they don't use video and their, their world has been completely upended. There are professors that, I mean, I'm working with full-time colleagues that have never used video before, you know, have never sort of, I mean, they're not very good on email, et cetera. You, they have, they have been, they've, we've taken health and education and we've taken it from 2020 and we've probably pushed it ahead uh, 10 years. And when you look at the bricks and mortar uh, for both health and education that Scott has been talking about, you know, the, the massive expenditures, um, like I know, for example, my numbers, I run a graduate program, my numbers, I'm, I'm now drawing students from all over the world. I've got students from, from Africa, from Pakistan, from China. They don't have to hop on planes. They don't have to rent apartments in Toronto. You know, so so I think this is the future. And there's data that when you have a significant economic event, a recession, a depression, a pandemic, is the change is permanent. So I think health and education are going to lead the way for businesses. They really are. And and I and and the nice thing about COVID, if there is a nice thing, and there isn't, <laughs> but the one nice thing is it's really caused the necessary technological change that many forward-thinking people have been advocating, including including all of us. Yeah, and, and so digital is a, in a very important wave here that companies have to support. Um, yeah. Which, by the way, just a very practical question: um, in the meetings that you're having, Richard, with these boards, I assume that they're all now virtual—Zoom, WebEx, you know, Microsoft Teams, whatever. Um, Absolutely. These these. There's, there's not a single in-person meeting for the next six months that I have. But you got these Luddite board members that you just talked about. How are they even handling all these meetings? Like, do they even know how to run these meetings online? Uh, I'm training chairs. I've got six training sessions with about 30 chairs on how to run a virtual meeting. And some of the chairs, you know, they tend to be older. They're in their 60s and some are in their 70s because they're, they're, they tend to be the, the director with the most experience. Um, but, but even, you know, individual directors that that you know don't don't aren't accustomed to to zoom and to eat and to tutor them it's like twitter you know 10 or 20 years ago you'd have that you know that 65 year old director saying what is what is twitter i'm getting now well what is zoom right so and even the use of cameras the use of of, of microphones so this is all new to them but you know what it's just like i i said they have to do it Right. So so i i have staff managers that will go to the director's house they'll put on a mask They'll go outside the house and the director will take a picture of the infrastructure inside the house, bring the picture out because they don't want to go inside the house and, and guide the 65 year old director on rewiring uh, Wi-Fi and installing a camera. So b boards are just adapting. And the nice thing about COVID is you've got no choice. You've just got to do it. So let's just get on with it. So I don't think, for example, that there that that boards are necessarily going to go back to I mean, the in person fine, but I predict that there's going to be a hybrid, right? There's going to be some meetings that will be virtual, some meetings that will be in person. It depends on the nature of the meeting. So, so again, just so what's um what's the like top two or three tips that you're giving people for running these online meetings? What are you telling these board chairs? Is less is more. Uh, you cannot have a, a a three or four hour meeting. It's the same as a class, right? I I can lecture. For three hours a board chair can chair a meeting for three hours but you can't do it on zoom on zoom on virtual on vi video less is more so take take 50 minutes and then take a a, a break of 10 50 minutes and then do the second half of the meeting and be very judicious in terms of your agenda your information flow um not everybody has to speak to every question you know and try to get vert try to be able to see your individual directors there are socioeconomic elements to this. Like there's there's some directors that are, are having meetings in their car because they, they have childcare responsibilities. These are the younger directors. There are some female directors that have said to me, well, listen, Richard, this is a privacy concern. I don't want my stuff, <laughs> right, visual to my colleagues, right? So so they they have the, the Zoom background and, and men have this too. So I think there's a bit of learning pain, uh, uh, pausing, you know, pa pausing, asking a question and being comfortable with that one minute of silence while people are processing this, uh, trying to recognize the visual cues using chat rooms, etc., and emojis. All this is uh, all this is happening. And, 
you know, people, directors are adapting. It's not how old you are. It's your it's your mental mindset. It, it, that, it, that's really all of it. You know, yeah, Richard, what are you saying? Go ahead. Well, I'm saying just capitalize on a point Richard's making. So I'm seeing an opportunity for those experienced board members if they can at least keep pace with what you're describing, Richard. I think that their value can be enhanced. For instance, you know, asking those difficult questions about, hey, look, what are the what are the models that we're entrenched in that we can evolve at this time? You know, how do we move away from further investment in those sunk costs? Uh, you know, the deferred maintenance for major institutions of higher education in America is, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, there's there's a um, uh, a uh, a major uh, uh, research one university that I've done some work with, and their their deferred maintenance is larger than their operating budget. That's difficult to catch up on. It, it may never be caught up on, you know. So they're constantly in a state of building and investing in, you know, these metaphorically speaking coal firing plants. Yeah. So those. So those experienced directors that you're talking about, if they can, you know, have maintenance to just stay as current as possible, they don't have to lead in technology, but if they can stay in the game, they're likely to ask some of those better questions that you're highlighting, Richard, about, you know, how do you remain diligent as a board member during the crisis? By the way, I do have one other follow-up for Richard and you, Scott. Um, I notice when I'm doing training for very senior level of executives in Zoom and other things, they are actually more hesitant to say things in an online forum that they would have in a classroom because they're worried it's being recorded and broadcast to the world. Is that affecting these board conversations? It's chilling because you never record a conversation uh, unless, like in some states, it's illegal. So I've had uh, questions yeah, about I, this, and I can sit here like this with a phone, even if you. Well, talk. yeah, is is, but it's it's sort of like goodwill and and integrity. I there was a lawsuit last week where the director recorded the other director, and and I I was asked by the lawyer. I said I've never seen that before. It's an integrity concern because you're not being truthful and honest with your colleagues. So so Zoom, I believe, and I think Teams has this as well. But if someone presses record it signals to everybody that the conversation is being recorded. And I liken it to, listen, you, you're, you're not gonna go to a board meeting and record the board meeting. You have proper minutes, you have you have a process and protocol in place. So you shouldn't be recording surreptitiously or even overtly um, uh, meetings. I mean, some professors record meetings because they've got students now in different time zones and they want the student to be able to record the lecture. But for, for boardrooms, it's it, it it's highly problematic behavior if someone records surreptitiously or even overtly. But so it's just not it shouldn't be it shouldn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Scott. Agreed. Agreed. In fact, it, it can't happen because I think it undermines the value of having this independent advice, you know, this independent counsel. And yeah, absolutely right. Um, we've we've had, um, uh, you know, the tech team comes in and they. Uh, set up Zoom in a uniform manner in the organization so it cannot be surreptitiously recorded. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's important. But, you know, those safeguards put in place are part of the diligence, you know, of operating effectively, you know, as a corporation, as a board in these unprecedented times. Well, actually, the other thing that both of you highlighted was the notion of, a, I'll call it diversity, because Richard, you made the comment about, you know, how female colleagues are worried about, you know, how the backgrounds are perceived or, or things of that nature. So <clears throat> how has diversity changed because of COVID or recent times in terms of being on the board's minds? Mm. Well, we know, for example, that diverse boards mitigate groupthink. And groupthink is when a group of homogenous people will prematurely agree and might make a, 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 a catastrophic decision because it's emotionally their their interlocks, their social relatedness disincents them from from asking tough questions and disagreeing. And diverse candidates, whether it be ethnicity, gender, um, I'm, I'm starting now to see uh, LGBT, in, including in California, there's there's a bill that's coming through for uh, quotas uh, on, on, on boards in New Jersey as well. To um, uh, to bring forth diverse candidates, um, so that the conversation will change. Because diverse candidates tend not to have the pre-existing interlocks, and they will they will mitigate groupthink. So 
we know, for example, that diverse boards make they're harder to manage because you've got diverse candidates, but they're they make better decisions. But I think what COVID has done, and 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 this goes back to the racial issues that and the systemic discrimination that is present in the United States and in Canada and and the police, uh, the dreadful police killings of unarmed black people um, is now reaching boardrooms. And we've got um, uh, African-American and African-Canadian and Indo-Canadian and Asian-Canadian have, have said to me, particularly the males, that the gender, Richard, has, and this is pre-COVID, the emphasis on gender diversity has left us marginalized. And the focus has, all, has, has, has been primarily on 30 or 40 percent women on boards. So what Black Lives Matter has done is it's brought ethnicity uh, front and center so that, that it is true diversity. It's not just uh, 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 gender, but it's, it's also uh, race. And we're starting to see uh, shaming of companies, as we saw in the gender diversity movement about 10 years ago, we're starting to see shaming of companies that, that don't have enough uh, non-Caucasian uh, richness uh, on, on their board. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. Uh, we're even looking at uh, um, management teams and, and the talent process in the company that might disincent uh, people from continuing and you might have a talent flight lower down of diverse candidates. So, so boards are putting this on their, on their radar and, they're, and, and, and I think that that's probably a good thing. That's a, definitely a good thing. Yeah. You know, Richard, I have a question for you. I, I agree with you uh, on this point. Do you think that there is a way that boards can play a systemic role in helping us find our way through this systemic historic racism to help companies ensure that they don't react, that they don't just, you know, take a, a shotgun approach and go out and try to find people of difference to add to their boards, but rather form a more systemic approach so that it can be thoughtful, not episodic, and you know, not short term. Do you think there's any opportunity there? Yeah, bo boards are looking at systemic uh, structure and promotion and um, treatment within their own companies that and and implied biases that. Uh, an adverse discrimination that might not be deliberate. Well, certainly deliberate is, 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 is but employee surveys, auditing of culture, yeah. um, diversity and inclusive practices, um, uh, the auditing of that, um, the, the effects of individuals right from the higher stage all the way through to the most senior uh, officers for systemic and, and systemic is getting a sort of ne it's it, it's not intended to be negative it's anything that is said and done in the company that might not be intentional but might be the result of cognitive or perceptual or or some sort of shortcoming or some legacy policy for example good good esg committees and this is back to joe's point good esg committees will say listen we need to look at this because we don't want to be on the it's not that you don't want to be on the news but you, we genuinely care Right. If people are unhappy in the workplace, we don't have a productive company. So we need we need to look at this. So I think what Black Lives Matter has done is is it, it said to boards inside the company, what are we doing? And they're asking these sorts of questions about talent management. Um, and we know, for example, when the work we've done together with mutual clients, the three of us, talent management tends to happen when you have female a, a strong female presence in the CEO suite. And we saw that with a recent appointment this week of, of Citibank and in senior management, because the right questions get asked. I mean, I ask these questions because I'm, I'm a researcher, but if you're sort of a 65, and I'm not painting with a broad brush, but if you're a 65 year old man, you're not, at, you're not, think, this is not your experience. So it comes from, from the right people in the right positions and even hiring of chief diversity officers. In, in, in institutions to look at this systemic structures that Scott was speaking to is, is a really good idea. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you mentioned Chief Diversity Officer and Joe, I'll yield to you in just a moment, but not only is that a position that I think boards should be prepared to interact with, but it also ties in, Richard, to your research around, you know, board composition matrices. I know you've done research, you know, globally on this topic, 
And that's where I was, uh, you know, pointing to when I was thinking about, you know, a systemic interactive, interactive being operative versus yep. a reactive or preactive, you know, yep. approach to try to fix something. This isn't about a fix. This is about getting better. Uh, uh, perfect. Well said. My only Agreed. thought is I have a challenge with a chief diversity officer role. And, and, and here's my challenge. Um, a long time ago, we I was working for a tech company and we hired somebody to be QA. And, and our QA <clears throat> quality got worse. <clears throat> and the reason why is because everybody assumed that it was the QA's responsibility to QA everything. And so people stopped worrying about quality because it's like, oh, the QA person will get it. And right. in a way, I worry that when we put these chief diversity officers in place. So again, I'm, I'm not opposed to diversity. I'm very clear about yeah. that. But it's almost like are we abdicating the responsibility that it's like somebody else's job to make this a more diverse organization. And, and, well, and it's, it's almost like it's it's got to be embedded yeah. throughout the whole. Right. Company. But but Joe, so I liken it to. Do you remember in business schools around 10 or 20 years ago, we, we, we started using business ethics courses. And then and then there's a faculty member like Joe that would put up his hand and say, well, hang on a second. Business ethics should be embedded in every single course. Yeah. And, the, and the business ethics proponents said, you're absolutely right. We have to start somewhere. Let's have a dedicated business ethics course. And hopefully in the next 10 years, we can disestablish it. We won't have to have it. I, I think the same thing is true with diversity officers to work with other managers and, to, and a dedicated person that will be the catalyst um, for 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 improving s some of these processes. So it, it it's not they shouldn't be the token or the target, much like the ethics was ten years ago. But you have to start somewhere. Is, is I guess the point. So again, back to what board committee should ultimately take the initial responsibility? If we have to start somewhere. Is it like a human capital committee? That should yes. be yes or who? Yes, the the, the the human resource. In fact, in the United States, it's called the compensation committee. Yeah. So it, it's always had a bias towards what are we paying our people, but good boards now are retitling this committee human capital talent management, and they're talking about and we know this from the work that we've done is diversity inclusion. Uh, ESG, incentivizing the right behaviors, whistleblowing, all of these cultural things uh, should be overseen by by a human capital committee. We've even got a couple of chapters in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book on human capital management. So this is the future. And I think COVID will accelerate this because of, of, of wellness. Yeah. You know, Richard, I wonder, uh, I think part of what our takeaway together from uh, a recent client uh, with you is that training and development is a key. Uh, boards need to be fed new content all the time. We can expect board members to come in to their director uh, directorial responsibilities fully prepared for everything. And, and COVID brings that to light. So with the work that you've done, uh, and, and in particular, I'm thinking about a global view here, but in the work that you've been doing, what is the appropriate cadence to bring these directors the continued training and development? You know, is it now monthly or is that something where we have to have deeper dived over time and it's more of a quarterly? What do you think the cadence is to keep our boards of directors as current as we can? Well, it's a fast moving target and the best practice is twofold. It's the industry associations such as the NACD in Washington uh, that really serves corporate and not-for-profit boards. So it's it's that, yeah. um, and, and it's got some 10,000 members. Um, and it's also in, in, in room, in board room, and now in virtual training with directors. Good boards will have 30 to 45 minutes of, of education every single meeting. And, and now, now I'm seeing it at the committee level. I'm even seeing disclosure of annual hours of, of education per director. I'm seeing expectations that each director will have eight to 12 uh, CPE hours annually. I'm seeing budgets uh, allocated to individual directors, $5,000, $10,000 to, to be able to attend courses, to be able to, 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 to get regular education and training. You know, pre-COVID, it, it used to be education was a luxury, but it's not. It's an essential, especially yeah. with the science and COVID and also information packages by the corporate secretary to upskill uh, the directors. So orientation, training, education, is is crucial. You can't, as as you said, Scott. You can't have directors showing up 
and just learning this by osmosis. It's got to be dedicated time. And we know, for example, from accountants, uh, doctors, lawyers, they all have a, a continuing uh, education requirements. So directors uh, are overseeing millions, if sometimes billions of dollars of investments as fiduciaries, they should have ongoing educational requirements as well. So so yeah. we're, we're seeing that. That's a best practice. So, Joe, I think that is another Agile dashboard item yeah. for boards. You know, how do you, how, you know, how do you prepare your boards to see the weak signals that you talk about, Joe, in the marketplace regularly? Yeah. You know, we can probably predict how boards will interact with managers, leaders, uh, uh, with some correlation to the education they're receiving. You know, I don't want to create a confirmation bias or anything, but... No, but that's a good post there, post there's postulation. That yeah. Is there a relationship between board effectiveness and education? There probably is. Well, I mean, we, would you bring up, or both bring up a really good point, that we're expecting these leaders to be able to, just as an example, look out in the marketplace, understand the changes in the market well whoever taught somebody how to do that you know just just telling somebody go look out in the marketplace and they don't really have any skill set to do this or back to analyze interpret statements they've never been you know exposed to these statements yeah. I, I think it makes a lot more sense to to kind of educate the board as a matter of fact i assume when we do secession planning boards probably don't do secessions for themselves do they Richard, have you ever run into boards that actually do secession play outside of a board chair? Do they think about secession like who my future board members are going to be and kind of groom them? No, for the most part, no, because they think they're going to live forever. They like the job <laughs> and they're not concerned with tomorrow. So succession planning is a good educational tool, not just for management, but for the board. Um, think, so, yeah. you know, we think like imagine if you went to your lawyer and your lawyer or your accountant said well i learned that in law school 25 years ago i think i vaguely remember it's the same with directors right you've got to be on top of things and you've got to be current and and you can't you don't get that from from the run of the mill meetings you get that from applied training that uh, and it can only it can't harm it can only help so it's uh, it really is a nascent industry uh, that is often overlooked by so so we've enjoyed work together by and it's only been you know a, a various boards but this needs to be addressed system wide and I think the time has come for certain standards for fiduciaries on boards of directors to have a minimal education component not a you know maximum but some sort of dedicated number of hours or exposure or training so that uh, you, you you continue to keep up with the pace of change. Yeah, absolutely right. And and in fact, I can, again, back to higher education, you know, $650 billion industry in America per year, 4,200 traditional colleges and universities, and board members are often cultivated based upon their philanthropy with the institution rather than any particular skill set that they will bring. Uh -huh. And I've been involved with a number of fine, fine institutions that have found themselves trapped in this model that is broken, but you know, continually optimized. When you think about what do you need a board member, a director of an institution of higher education to be able to understand, well, they need to be thinking about the future of work. They need to be thinking about the industry of higher education. They need to be thinking about executive comp, executive succession. They need to be thinking about the things, Richard, that you're highlighting are so important to receive that education on. But that minimum threshold, you know, we, we're all familiar with AGB, the Association of Governing Boards, which is one of the you know more dominant authorities in the higher ed industry. We got to get on this seriously. Okay. This is, you know, this is big business, just as our not-for-profit health systems. Yeah. How you know how those boards of directors for the practical part? Because and we, I'd be careful on how much we say because we all have some experience with this. But yes. when you actually try and assess the actual board members, they don't like it. <laughs> no, I was just going to say to Scott, like if I donated all this money. And yeah. you invite me onto the board. And first of all, I'm not sure that that should happen. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And secondly, let's assume I come onto the board and now I'm going to undergo a competency assessment. 
about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. I'm, I, and this is a voluntary board. Health and education are voluntary. You don't get paid. So let me let me have this straight. Is that I, I give you money, you bring me onto the board, and now you're going to begin to assess my competencies. Is that is that the deal? Right. Yeah. So there's an inherent aversion to yeah. the assessment. But you know, uh, we have peer assessment in medicine, we've got it in accounting, we've got it in law, and it's not as onerous. It's everybody's good at something and not good at other things. You know, you might have an accountant. That, that can read a balance sheet but doesn't know about cybersecurity. You might have a CIO that can't read a balance sheet. You've got a balance of skills, and we know from the work that we've done with healthcare organizations, it is entirely appropriate to have to have a, a skilled base recruitment, not a, a a donation. I mean, you can you can inc include donations, but the driver really should be the competencies for health and education. Yeah. 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 But I mean, as a board, it's got to be know thyself. And, and so many boards, I don't think they know themselves. And, and that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Really important point. Really important point. And uh, Richard, just to just to you know try to close that loop. So uh, not only then do we bring a board member on based upon something, and these are all good people, uh, but we bring them on and then all of a sudden, typically, they're then responsible for the evaluation of the CEO, <laughs> of which they may not be prepared to do. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, so these things are sort of confounding. And to your point, you know, this is still nascent. This is, you know, this is emergent and we're still finding the best practices that are yet to come. Hey, you're, Scott, you nailed it. The number one job of the board is to hire, fire and assess and pay the CEO. And I can't tell you countless boards, including publicly traded companies, hospitals, universities, that they don't evaluate the CEO because they've they've never been trained to do so. And they don't know what should be in a contract. They don't even a CEO contract, right? Is, is that I've had CEOs draft their own contract and the board has signed on to it. Uh, and, and then they get into trouble three or four years later when the CEO is underperforming or you're trying to fire the CEO, not even getting basic legal advice on the contract or even how to assess the CEO. So yet it, it defaults and the CEO doesn't want to be assessed in any rigorous way. So it defaults into a, a, a sort of pro forma oral discussion, right? On the, and these are major boards, right? So even education on your basic roles and responsibilities as a director is, is only helpful. It's only helpful. Yeah, yeah. And of course, in a crisis, like a global pandemic, uh, you know, time seems to shrink. And that interaction, you know, the shortening of the interaction cycle time that we're all referring to, but now, uh, you know, naming here, uh, does mean, as you highlighted at the start of the discussion, Richard, that, uh, you know, boards are speaking with leadership teams much more frequently. Uh, you know, they're touching base, they're checking in on issues, they're helping executive team, the best boards, ask the right questions so that we don't find ourselves optimizing these historic models or broken models. Yeah, I've got uh, two or three chapters in my book on CEO succession and CEO pay just because it's so important. Um, and, and getting exposure, as Scott said, to high potential talent and having an emergency CEO succession plan, a permanent, and what, what that should look like, and mentoring of senior talent, and whether they're becoming CEO ready. This is all not only vital, it's the most important thing the board does. You can get everything in my book right, and if you don't get your selection of CEO right, you're dead. You can get, you can, you can get everything in my book wrong, but if you've got the right CEO and you've selected them properly, you're gold. So hiring, firing, and paying the CEO, in fact, Stanford University said the average board spends two hours a year on what we're talking about. And it's their most important role. They spend two hours a year on CEO succession. So it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial to get that right. Yeah, no, that makes that makes so much sense. And so as we come near to the end of our broadcast, <clears throat> you know, this is a, a segment which we call Simple Rules. And I want to combine it with one of the things that you were just talking about and, and where we started which is you made a reference to uh, Ram Charan and, and Mike Yassim and the, the point of you know when to lead, when to follow, when to get out of the way. So as we think about simple rules, I'm just gonna lightning round. You know, what's sort of the biggest tip that you would say come to mind right now, Richard and Scott? When do you lead? What should boards be doing right now 
in terms of leadership? One quick, simple rule, top of your mind. Uh, well, maybe I'll go first. Leadership should be uh, the pandemic plan, uh, strategy, and risk. Um, when boards should take charge uh, should be CEO succession. We talked about that. Um, ethics and integrity um, and compensation. All right, Scott. Yep, yep. So I'll go back to the comment, the discussion around behavioral health. You know, boards must ask. They must ask the questions that leaders don't necessarily have the time to ask themselves or even remember when they're running the business. You know, great boards ask the questions that need to be asked. When should boards follow right now? What's What should be top of the mind on when they need to take a step back? Uh, when it comes to operational issues um, and delegated authority, and that's all it takes is one director. And frequently, as we know, it tends to be a, a, an industry director or someone with specialized expertise. Boards need to follow and step back and not micromanage and not get into the operations of the organization. That is the number one complaint I have of management teams is, is one or two directors that, that don't know where that governance versus management light, line is. That's crucial. And by the way, a symptom seems to be that if you're having weekly board meetings with all the managers, you know that's way too much. Right, right. Scott? Yeah, too much. I, I, I agree. I, I can't come up with another one beyond Richard, but but I'll refer back to Kahneman. You know, boards need to be able to think fast and slow. And when thinking fast, they want to stay away from day-to-day -day management. When thinking slow, they want to make sure that they're not allowing the organization to slumber into complacency, especially back to when it comes to investing in sunk costs or old or broken business models. No, that's great. And finally, when you out of the way. Uh, my, my previous point about operational issues and management and getting below, getting uh, uh, contacting staff uh, who are direct reports to the CEO is a no-no. That will drive a CEO crazy. You have one employee, and that's the CEO. Yep. yep. Scott. Scott. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, I think about boards board getting board out of the way when it comes to the customer interface. You know, the oper operationalization of that customer relationship does not seem to me where the board needs to live. The satisfaction of the customer seems to me where boards need to need to reside. So, you know, get out of the way when we're making the sausage and building that customer intimacy. Uh, but ask us about the satisfaction and the value that the customer is receiving. Great. And I'll leave it uh, there as a final word. So I want to thank everybody uh, for your time today. I want to thank everybody that's watching. And if you're looking for more information uh, about uh, any of our guest panelists or authors on the show as well, learningcommunities.com, uh, please check out Richard's book, which is the Handbook of Corporate Board, or sorry, Handbook of Board Governance, second edition, Wiley Press, found up on Amazon amongst other places. And again, thanks Richard and Scott for your time today. And uh, as I like to say, can't drive a car looking through the rear view mirror. So uh, make sure that uh, you look forward and looking forward to seeing you at our next edition of Office Hours. Everybody have a good day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.